Now, a um, couple of months back when I said, you know, we ought, to have, uh, we ought to have Eric speak. It's been several years since we had him speak. And uh, I said, I want to tell you, Eric, we're going to give you December 26th, the day after Christmas. And then he said, well, there will be a lot of people gone. It might, the crowd might be a little thin. So we decided to give him this Sunday, all right? And uh, so Eric is uh, one of our guys right here. This is an amazing story. And by the way, some of us have heard it before, but it's kind of like the way he's doing it today. It's kind of like you never heard it uh, in the first place. Give Eric a hand as he comes and uh, speaks for us this morning. All right. God bless you, man. Take your time. When the time was right, the sea parted, the walls fell, the sun stopped, the waves were calmed, <clears throat> the stone was rolled away, clouds parted, and the Lord ascended. That's a, a summary that... Uh, Jan Markell uses on her radio show summarizing the sovereignty of God. This is a topic that uh, you can read about and, and get one perspective on it. If you read the Bible, you certainly see it. You can't miss it in the Bible. It's all the way through it. But the other way you, you could approach it is by um, direct experience, and that's what happened to me. I was um, raised in a Christian family, and um, my grandmother always told me, uh, Oh, Eric, God's in control. God's in control. As, as a boy, I didn't really know what that meant, but now I do. My uh, uncle taught about uh, God's sovereignty and his grace, and my dad prayed to the Father in Jesus' name, and my mom always seemed to try to get me to read the Bible. She bought me Bibles all the time, and I seemed to just kind of put them aside. But the time was, would come when uh, I would encountered God's sovereignty. Um, there, there's a, a radio talk show host, Alistair Begg, and many of you know who he is. He, um, he uh talks about the sovereignty of God all the time. And, and one of the definitions he gives, which is quite simple and, and profound at the same time, is that the sovereignty of God is the hand of God working in the glove of circumstance. And so you don't see the hand. You see the glove. And... The scripture itself, Jesus said, cannot be broken. And the reason it can't be broken is because the Bible itself is, originates in God himself, the sovereign God. There's a, there's a psalm, which we'll, we'll run into in the story, Quite profound. It's been a, it's been a, um, a, a lo very loved psalm over the centuries. Psalm ninety one. Listen to verse one, where two different names for God are used. The Most High is one. That's in the Hebrew. That's El Elyon, and 
God Almighty, El Shaddai, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. There is security and protection in God Most High, God Almighty. These Hebrew names stress God's power as the sovereign ruler over his creation. In the middle of that psalm, verses 3 to 13, kind of the meat of the psalm, it explains the deliverance that God uses through angels. Angels are another race of personal beings that are, are spiritual and um, so I'd like to suggest to you right away that, that um, God's hand doesn't reach down per se, but that he, what he does is he uses angels, and sometimes we may not be aware of it. Or maybe sometimes you, you would be. Elizabeth Elliot told the story. She was a great missionary. Her, her husband was Jim Elliot. And she told the story of having to walk home in a, through a dark alley one night in a foreign country. And, and she told the story that uh, she prayed because it was very unsafe. And uh, she trusted the Lord and... and she looked behind her, and there was a German shepherd about 10, 15 feet behind. And uh, when she stopped, they would stop. But she sensed that that German shepherd was an angel, and that's possible. In uh, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we get this one verse, chapter 1, verse 14, where it says, All angels are angels not all ministering spirits sent out to, to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So the, why are they sent out? Or to whom are they sent out? Are they sent out to those who have already received salvation? No. They're sent out by God to those who will inherit salvation. God knows who will and who won't come to faith in his son. I find that remarkable. Now, as I, as I brush through this, this is, this is my quick summary of the sovereignty of God in the Bible as a background, and uh, maybe I've even gone too far already, but, but um, there, there are some profound statements in, in uh, Isaiah 43 and 46, and, and Daniel. It's just really too much to, to get into, but um, someday, someday maybe. Okay, um, now, as far as my background goes, uh, I told you a little bit about that. And I want to say that God provided witnesses, and uh, God is never left without witnesses. And, um, but I was stubborn and selfish, and I continued on my own way. Does that remind you of anything in the scriptures? How about Isaiah 53, verse 6? Um, each of us has turned um, I forget the, the, the verse. Of, each of us has turned to his own way. Is, is one of the lines in that uh, verse. 
But uh, the witnesses that, that God sent, uh, he sent a friend in college who repeatedly told me about our need for Christ's sacrifice. Um, and um, so I was, I was dead spiritually and uh, needed to be rescued from God's, by God's sovereign hand. And uh, I was living in Seattle in, in, in 1990 with uh, two friends, Dan and Bill. And um, Dan had just earned a, uh, a flight. He was studying to become a pilot. And he did so, and he... Uh, he uh, um, he had taken several flights around the Puget Sound with uh, with Bill, and so the, it seemed like they were getting to know it well, and and uh, he was getting some experience in, and and then the time came when we were invited to a wedding in Spokane, and and so we uh, Dan said that he, hey, why not why not let's fly over, and so we did, and. And uh, the, the trip over from Seattle to Spokane, we went straight over the Cascades. And in fact, we flew right over this city and, and uh, um, landed in Spokane. And it was, it was, a, it was a fine wedding. And, and let's, let's, let's show those wedding pictures from the, uh, that night. And uh, because we have, there's Dan. And there, there's... Uh, the, the reception, and the, the and there's a, the, uh, part of the reception on, on the on the on the right there. That's Bill, and that's Dan, and that's John. Those are the three other people that were in the plane with me. And this here is Chris Zayner, and and Zayner was uh, Zayner was uh, influential because. Uh, uh, I was in his wedding, uh, and uh, the, just some the months before this, and and uh, so when he came to see me in the hospital at one time, uh, um, I was it was um, he he uh, I was really wasn't thinking very well, and and he uh, his visit made me think that. That I had to get to. Uh, it was later on that night when I, I slept, and, and he, he, I was dreaming that I was late for his wedding, and I had to, had to get there, and, and uh, so I got it. I crawled out of bed, and, and they, um, they, uh, the nurses thought I had gone completely berserk, and, and they, uh, they, be, they began to strap me in, in bed. But um, anyway, so. So, um, so on the on the next morning, the morning after the the wedding, we uh, can we have the map, and we we flew, we flew from uh, uh, Spokane to Dalway down to. The Dalles are here, and then Dan went to to fill up the tank with fuel, and it was Cessna has a plane that's it's called a wet wing, and the fuel is stored in the wings, um, which is kind of important. And um, so our wings, we were in the Dalles, and our wings are full of fuel, and. And uh, Dan and Bill and I, I'm, no, Dan was filling the tank with, with fuel, and Bill and John and I went to the vending machines, and we were boasting about being home in 70 minutes. Little did we know what would happen. And so we took off from the Dells, and, and, and we flew... We were flying along, and, and Dan was telling us about his his uh, 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 
sailboarding adventures down on uh, the Columbia River as we flew. And uh, we got past, we flew past Hood River and we were flying along this way. And we got somewhere right about there and the, the clouds hit us and everything changed. Um, we, we could all tell that, that Dan was rattled, that uh, he was, his composure was shaken and, and, and everyone in the plane thought that that uh, that was the last we'd be seen from. But uh, so he began to dive, to, to descend, as we, as we flew toward Hood River. And, um, but the problem is that we, um, there, there were witnesses who, who, who watched the plane descend, and, and they, they uh, talk about the, um, the fact that we came in too steep. We were too high, and we came in too steeply. And so that caused us to bounce off the runway, and and Dan radioed in that he was going to uh, make a go around. So he pulled up. We're there in the Hood River. We uh, that we hit we, we hit right about there and bounce off. And Dan began to pull around. We began to go around. And we, we were, the 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 plane was shaking and 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 the engine was screaming at fl at full uh, power, full throttle, and uh, um, the the winds were coming at us, uh, and it, it was a battle. Uh, but my dad estimates that, that 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 lasted about fifteen to thirty seconds, and then. Um, um, what does what uh, a witness saw us, and what did he say? He said, um, um, "Here it is." He he saw us coming around in a shallow to medium bank. Then he saw that we kept rolling beyond 90 degrees. The nose of our plane pitched up, the plane stalled, and came straight down, falling about 200 feet. So the miracle is that we, we hit this house in such a way, you, you can kind of see at least we've been able to to deduce uh, from from well. First of all, notice notice the the the, the, the um, landing gear. It's completely bent back. It, normally, if you see a plane, it's it's like this. The landing gear's up, but it's completely bent back. My dad noticed that, and and. and uh, so we, we started putting things together, and we think that um, the landing gear hit first, and then the, the nose of the plane hit right about there, right above the, uh, the outside wall, which is about the best place you can get for cushioning, uh, if you want to call it cushioning. But um, the the fact is, we uh, like my dad said um, later on, it's a miracle that anyone survived. It really is, and and uh, but uh, Dan did die, and. Uh, um, I, I, I've struggled with this. I've thought about it a lot. Um, I, I asked his mom when, when, a couple of years later. Uh, we had lunch with them at their house, and I asked her whether or not Dan was a believer, and, and uh, she 
she assured me that he was, and, and so that's good. Um, but then again, who knows? God, only God knows. And so, but from what I know now about what happens at death, uh, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone without knowing the Lord Jesus as Savior because our sins separate us from God and they will continue to separate us from God after death. That is to say, um, you'll be uh, consigned, is a good word, you'll be consigned to uh, Hades, or, um, and then in Revelation 20, Hades gets thrown into hell. So, all that to say that praise the Lord for sending Jesus as the Savior to give us a way to avoid this, this second death. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I'm not making a judgment, uh, but I'm just telling you what, what I, the things that I do know. Uh, but I hope Dan was a believer. It may be that he was. Um, but in any case, our wings were full of aviation fuel, and notice how they didn't they didn't rupture and and the, this this next our neighbor who lived here yeah this guy i think this guy um alan herman i talked to him on the phone uh in 20 uh, 8, 2018 or 2019 and uh he was quite he remembered everything Almost like it was yesterday. He he talks about it quite fluently. It was interesting, but but he uh, he was just about to jump into the shower and, and he heard the the plane coming down and, and he knew what it was and he ran over and and uh, uh, he he saw that our our engine the engine of our plane was was red hot and starting to flame. And so it's, it's very likely that without him, uh, uh, the house would have burned. And if the house would have burned, the, the plane would have caught on fire. And if the plane would have caught on fire, there would have been a huge explosion because those wings were full of aviation fuel. Not just any old fuel, aviation fuel, which is highly uh, flammable. Okay. And so um, all these things are coming into play and... and uh, and I wish I was more organized, but, but there's so many avenues that, that, that could be explored and, and that it's, it's just a matter of kind of what, what, uh, what, what happens, what, how the Lord leads this. But, but uh, um, the emergency crews arrived and cleared us from the wreckage in about half an hour. They wanted to helicopter us to Portland but the storm wouldn't allow it. Um, so an ambulance took us to the local hospital, and um, so the the other two guys, um, Dan, Dan, um, Bill, and John, were uh, um, they were uh, their backs were broken, and my neck was broken. But, but somehow the paramedics got us all out of there without spinal cord injuries. That's another amazing thing. Um, they used the, the jaws of life. Uh, but um, so, um, and my injuries were so, were so severe. I'm not even going to list them because it, it's, it's, too much, it's too much to bear right, right at one time. But uh, it, it's fair to say that, that I almost died twice. That if I would have died physically, I would have died spiritually as well. Which, and, and remember that um, spiritual death is, is separation from the author of life, from God. And so uh, that's what happens when a person dies without having received the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So I got to move faster. Um, I lost a lot of blood, and they had to give me a blood transfusion. Um, and they resuscitated me with, with fluids and, and uh, dopamine, and put me on a ventilator, and then they ambulanced us to uh, put us on an ambulance on the way to uh, Emmanuel Hospital in, in Portland. And during that time, the doctor who had treated us called my dad in Wenatchee here and uh, Mr. Singleton, do you have a 28-year-old son named Eric? Yes. He's been in an airplane crash, seriously injured. And then something happened on, on the doctor's end, and he had, he had he was taken away. And so um, that's how my family heard about it, and they... they um, I think they remember. They're, they're, they're right there. And they, uh, Sharon and, and Dad and Mom went to, drove to Bellevue to pick up Susan. And they drove all night to Portland to Emanuel Hospital and they got there the next morning at 7.30. And so the, the, this happening that um, came about... Um, because my mom had told me when I was a teen, I, I, I was, I was uh, mouthing off about my sisters. And, and um, you know, I was like 17 or 18. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and mom, mom looked me squarely in the eye and she said, Eric? Because I, I, was, I was lauding the friends I had at school or something. And she said, Eric, friends will come and go. But your family will always be there for you. And I never forgot that. So the, the, on Monday morning, the, the pressure inside my head was, so, was three times the normal. And Dr. Morris, this big uh, six-foot-six doctor uh, at Emmanuel, a neurosurgeon um, meets with my dad and says, look, something has to be done this very hour. I could do brain surgery, but there's a chance that, of infection. What do you want me to do? <laughs> and dad, dad said, do whatever it takes to save my son. So Dr. Morris operated on my um, brain, and, and he relieved he relieved the, the the high pressure in there, and and healing could begin then at that point. Um, a week later, I'm laying there, and, and I was in a coma, but still you you hear things, you 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 can tell there's something there. But it's just not like it was. You know what I'm saying? It's just much more gray, grayish. And and I remember um, hearing my mom's voice, and 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 they they took records of this so I can read about it. But but uh, my mom was talking to me, and and uh, I couldn't really do anything but raise my eyebrows. So I did that, and then they recorded that, and that was my way of saying, "I, I, I hear you." But, but uh, um, the other one of the things about it is is the uh, at Emmanuel, the uh, there there was no hope given to my family at all, no hope at all. Uh, he's he's going to be a vegetable. He's. Uh, uh, we don't know why you guys are still coming here. Uh, everybody else would have would have left him as a ward of the state by now. Well, you know, what are you doing? And it, it's an evil. It's a real evil. And I explored it a little bit, thinking that I could 
kind of gain a, a big perspective. Uh, Sharon bought me a book called the Culture of Death. And this, this, this man wrote it who, who encountered the same problems. Uh, and it's just an ugly thing, that, that, and it's a reality that's out there. And I think it's getting worse. But, but, but uh, anyway, there's, pro there's probably big money in, in, the, uh, in the transplantation business, the body parts transplantation. And so, um, but, there, but uh, anyway, I'm going to move on. They, uh, they, uh, there's, uh, there was a time when, when uh, human beings being made in the image of God well, it was pretty important. Um, and it resulted in what we call the sanctity of human life. But I see that, I don't know about you, but I see that fading away. And uh, um, anyway, so um, they, um, from Emmanuel, I, I was taken to uh, Seattle. And by the way, the, my fa fam family was highly involved in, in the, this, the uh, organization of where he's going to go next and what, what's the right facility for him to go. And, and so uh, without them, who knows? I probably w wouldn't even have made it through. But uh, um, so I was down to 157 pounds, which is skin and bones. And um, they were, um, this is at Synagogue, and, and the therapist came in to talk to me, and, and, and they did so, and they, they, they quickly recognized that, that uh, he's got a problem with reality. He's not, he's not understanding it. So they, they, in a nice professional way, they, they took me to a, a room with, with wrestling mats on the floor. They, they locked my wheelchair. They said, okay, show us, show us how you can walk. And I fell flat on my face. Right, and, and didn't get hurt. I mean, it was a wrestling match, but, but I realized at that point, I've got a battle, I've got a long, long battle ahead of me. There were, uh, then those therapists took me to the parallel bars, and, uh, um, that those I, I did walk through uh, slowly, but as it's been said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so the, there was a chaplain here at Synagogue. His name was Scott. He came in to read, and he read Psalm ninety-one to me. It was at the exact same time that Sharon had brought in a wall hanging of Psalm 91. And I said, this, what is this about? How, how could that be? So I was asking her, did you guys plan this out? Are you trying to spook me? No. Uh, but I was certain that they had colluded. Um, but... When I found out that they hadn't, I was, I was thinking, hmm, something else is, is somebody else is, is running this show. There were nurses there at, at Synagogue who were two Christian nurses. Actually, one was a, 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 a RN and one was a, a CNA. But they, they seemed to work in, in tandem. Uh, their names were John and Dory. And, and they said to me over and over, no one survives what you live through unless God's hand is upon him. And uh, at that time, I didn't, it's not like I could have walked away and, 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 and done something else. 
All I could do was lay there in the bed and think about it. And I, that's what I did. And it, it was, it was, a, it was a, a revolutionary uh, thing. John and Dory, uh, not, not my own words, they, they loved me like a brother. That's my sisters. They, they remember that. And um, at the same time, my dad was saying, it's a miracle that anyone survived. And around that, about that time, to use a biblical uh, analogy, uh, something like scales began to fall from my eyes. Paul, Paul talks about that in, in Acts 9. And uh, we had Thanksgiving that year at the synagogue, and uh, my sister Susan said, this is the best Thanksgiving we've had. We were together, and they, they just they weren't sure whether or not I'd ever be with them again, at least uh, uh, cognitively. So then we, we moved to, uh, I can say I'm, I'm going way too slow. Um, we were, uh, I moved to Good Samaritan Hospital, and, and um, that was where I stayed the most time. Uh, uh, there was an extreme loss of strength and emotion, and uh, that had to be gained back little by little, day by day, therapy session by therapy session, and uh, um, there was a doctor at Good Sam named Sherburn W. Heath, MD, and uh, do we have a picture of him? There he is. There's Sherburn. Um, Thank God for Dr. Heath. He knew what he was facing in me, yet he waited for the right time. He waited till the evenings when the hospital business was all was mostly done. And he came into my room and he, and he said, he would say to me, Eric, how are you doing spiritually? I didn't want to answer. I, I, I tried to shrug it off. I tried to say, I tried to pretend like I didn't hear it. But, but day after day, this happened. He did it lovingly. He did it, he did it at the right times. And uh, it just ate me up. And slowly, over time, I realized that, well, it took a while, but, but um, it really convicted me. Because he, he would talk about the Bible. He, he, would, he would say, how, how are you doing spiritually? And then he would talk about this incident in the Bible or that. And I didn't want to hear it. I just didn't want to hear it. But, but there he was. And there I was. And again, could I, could I have walked out? No. I mean, I could have rolled out of my wheelchair. But, but. So this battle raged. But I stubbornly clung to old, familiar, sinful ways, thinking that I was going to go back to where, where I was. But that didn't happen. It came came to be March of uh, late March of ninety one, and uh, um, my next stop was the same hospital, but in their outpatient apartments. And so, what they would do is they they would uh, uh, they had these apartments that were about a mile, three quarters of a mile from the hospital, and and they'd send out. Uh, uh, a little uh, van, and they'd pick up the student, the, the patients at the apartments, and they'd go back and forth. Um, 
like that. Um, and uh, my sister Susan came down to see me twice a week during this time. I went every Wednesday and Saturday. And uh, I began to challenge myself, um, the... Uh, or I should say they, they encouraged me to challenge myself and uh, the therapies went on and, and uh, there, there was a time when, when a lot of improvement was being made and it seemed like I was going to, it seemed to me like I was going to whip this thing and then be, and be fine. There was this therapist named Chris Eirig and he... Um, he, he, he read me like a book, and he, he said, uh, Eric, there will be deficits. I tried to ignore it again. There will be deficits. Uh, uh, there will be deficits. And I finally sunk in. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I was hurt worse than I, than I, than I now realize. And so that was an eye opener. And um, there was a time when I went out to dinner with my sisters, and uh, I, w I was trying at that time. I was trying to. Um, I had it in my mind to make fun of Dr. Heath, and if I could make fun of him, I would have been uh, assaged. I would have been. Uh, I would have, my rebellion would have stayed in place. Um, and so we parked somewhere and I, and I got out and I had, I had my, uh, my impersonation of him down. I was going to pull my slacks up and make those, because he was older at that time and I was younger and, and I was going to make fun of him. And he, he, he made old man sounds, at least that's what I thought. And uh, so I was going to make fun of him. And uh, all I needed was Susan and Sharon to laugh with me. And then I would have been, ha ha, lost. But Sharon looks at me, didn't smile, didn't laugh, and she says, Eric, have you considered that maybe Dr. Heath is right? So I was, I was, um, that, that bugged me for a long time. And, and, and it wasn't very long after that that, that, uh, that, uh, there came a day, and it was toward the end of my, uh, stay there in, in the, in the, rehabilitation program and uh, I was walking out of the hospital Good Sam Hospital and and you get to know the people and I got to know the, 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 the cab driver who took us back and forth to the apartments and, and I said to him uh, I'm going to walk home he said okay go ahead of course there, there's hills involved it's quite a, quite a bit more than you, than you think, but but uh, I, at that time I, I was in a four legged I had a four legged cane that I used, and uh, anyway I struggled home, and on that walk home I call it my walk of life, because on that way home I all these things were, were stirring around my brain, and I thought, hmm. Maybe I'm the one that needs to change. This is a... So I got home, and I, and I don't remember the prayer, but, but it was something like, God, I recognize your hand. And uh, it wasn't a beautiful prayer. I don't even think I prayed in Jesus' name. I just said that. And, and, but things began to change. He heard me, and... and, and and uh, changes came that, that I would never would have dreamed of. There's a lot of some of them I don't even want to go into, but but uh, lifestyle changes, 
And um, so that that was it for the uh, for the um, for the hospitalization, and then moved here to Wenatchee and um, um, got set up and, and began to continue rehabilitation uh, on my own. And uh, so th this it was a it was a thing that, that took a number of years and and, and uh, um, but there there are two there's two sides of it though the, the physical side which 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 slowed down and stopped and there's the uh, spiritual side which is is the side we're all destined for and uh, and that side is 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 going to come up, um, be um, taken into um, in full in full mode when when uh, our bodies are resurrected and um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 speaking of the resurrection body it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So, God changed me. I didn't ask for it. It took my body to be broken, but the eyes of my heart were miraculously opened. I didn't do it myself. Through nothing that I deserve, nothing that I would have chosen, God allowed me to glimpse the gloves of his sovereign hand. 